Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. This is Michael Waits from ATP Stories, and I'm talking today with Arthur Hayes, the founder, co-founder, do I have that right, of BitMEX. Um, how are you? I'm very good. It's a good afternoon, and Bitcoin price is rising, which makes me happy. All across the board, it looks like to me, right? Yeah, it's been an amazing month. Yeah, I mean, this actually has been an amazing month for Bitcoin, ICO, I mean, anything sort of anything sort of blockchain, Ethereum related just seems to be in the news, all over the news. Even the IOTA stuff you saw went up 15% today. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but like the market's on fire. Yeah, it's a, it's a bull market everywhere you look. Yeah, and what does that mean? I mean, I look at what's going on on, on BitMEX, right? What did you say a couple of days ago? You had a record day. You did $400 million of turnover. It's got to be higher today, no? Yeah, so we did uh, our best ever, I think, was slightly over half a billion U.S. dollars traded in a 24-hour period, and that was uh, a few days ago. And we've had two such uh, over 500 million U.S. dollars per day uh, days in the last week. Do you get the sense that that's insane? Coming from, you know, 2014 when we uh, sometimes didn't do a single trade in, in a whole 24 hours, it's a surreal moment. I was going to say, I mean, look, you've been at the forefront of this for a while now. You want to back up a little bit and talk about graduating from Wharton, going out working at Deutsche Bank and even at Citigroup. I mean, these are two completely different environments than what you're doing today, right? Yeah, but and in, in a certain way, it gave me preparation for having the financial knowledge to actually take what's been done and try to amend it to work for this particular industry. Do you want to tell me how? I mean, you may, I don't know if you checked my profile as well, but I worked at Deutsche Bank, actually Deutsche Securities, right, a long time ago, so back 1998, 1999 into 2000. And one of the things we did was we were the first people to write algorithms for portfolio trading, so very familiar with how technology affects the trading market. So I'm just curious, like, what you think you learned when you were at Deutsche and City that prepared you to do this? Well, specifically, I worked on the exchange traded fund or ETF yep. trading and market making desk. And when I started, Deutsche Bank Europe had created the Deutsche Bank X Trackers product to try to catch cash in on the ETF boom that had started in America and was now coming to Europe. So that was a pretty successful product in around 2008 slash nine when I started. And so they wanted to bring that out to Asia because they believe the ETF uh, trading revolution would touch Asia as well. So I was um, the trader that was brought on board to help uh, grow that product in Asia as a new graduate. And it's kind of similar to what happened with the Bitcoin space. You have a great idea of something that you think is going to work in terms of a tradable product. Um, you do a lot of work to get the product ready to list, to launch. You launch the product. And then nothing trades. Uh, so, you know, we, we have spent all this uh, time and effort getting uh, our listings ready. We have some listings in Hong Kong and Singapore, and we have uh, no trades, uh, very little interest from, from clients. And then uh, we got China right. So the, the big thing, you know, back before this Chinese stock market imploded was that foreign investors wanted access to China. Right. And the way they got that was through um, performance notes, whereby the bank would use its uh, qualified foreign investment um, quota, the QFI quota, right. to essentially buy Chinese A shares on behalf of investors, foreign investors. And the foreign investors would give them US dollars. Yeah, so. so we essentially use an ETF to access China and that is when the product line actually got some traction. So let me ask you this, though. When you started, right, you said there were very few trades in the Deutsche Bank um, ETF program. I mean, is that – in a way, it's different than what you're doing now. And in my, from my perspective, right, back then, at least, you know, whether it was State Street, SSGA, or, you know, BGI into BlackRock, the iShares product was already very well established, right? So you were coming into a market that was super well established, depending on where you were listing your ETFs and what the backing of it was, right? But now – are there other Bitcoin? I mean, there are tons of markets for Bitcoin, right? But are there derivatives? That's what you're doing, right? You're basically focusing on derivatives, so futures or like sort of non-expiration futures for Bitcoin. It seems like a slightly different market to me and a different stage of maturity, no? 
Yeah, definitely the Bitcoin market is in infancy in terms of the types of financial products offered. Uh, so, you know, we are the premier derivatives exchange for Bitcoin. We're purely a derivatives exchange. We don't offer uh, spot trading or margin trading uh, like some of the other platforms that listeners might be familiar with. So uh, we have basically saw the landscape when we got involved in this, you know, early, late 2013, early 2014, and recognized that it's going to be very tough for a new entrant to steal liquidity away from a spot exchange. Right. And it's very difficult to keep a bank account as a Bitcoin spot exchange. Uh, the banks do not want high transaction volume businesses, whether they be Bitcoin or something else, money services businesses are not welcome clients for banks and they will clutch your, cut off your account at a moment's notice. And we've seen that happen to some of um, the premier Bitcoin spot trading exchanges. Why is that? So we wanted to be a, um, because of uh, regulation, compliance, KYC, KYC, AML, the okay. amount of uh, issues that a high transaction account can cause for a bank to the managers of a bank, it's just not worth the hassle, even if the account is very profitable and pays lots of fees. So is the main thing the KYC stuff? I noticed that to sign up to be able to trade on BitMEX, you really only need a valid email address, and that means that all the trading is anonymous. Is that right? Uh, yes, but we don't do exchange. So the reason why uh, we yeah. don't allow we, we let email and, and you know just Bitcoin is uh, you know we don't let people exchange value and purely derivatives and that's sort of a decision we made and we think it's been a very uh, wise decision because we don't get involved in a lot of the issues uh, that a lot of our spot exchange um, brethren have to, to deal with. So tell me exactly like from founding to today how things are different from no trades a day to half a billion dollars in a, in a day of trading and like what the most popular products are per se. So initially when we started we thought that Bitcoin was going to be adopted by legacy financial institutions in 2000, late 2013, early 2014. So we looked around and we saw that the uh, leverage trading product options available were not uh, like what a JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank would be familiar with. So we wanted to create a Wall Street type futures contract. So it was lower leverage. Um, we said that we would guarantee the settlement of all trades and we launched this product and it was not received well by the market because the market never matured to uh, these large financial institutions trading Bitcoin. Right. What happened was that there was lots of retail traders uh, who wanted extremely high leverage and ability to speculate on Bitcoin and other digital currencies. So we pivoted to focus on retail investors in um, the third quarter of 2015 um, and that's when we took our leverage from three times to a hundred times in about a month, and that's what really kicked off the uh, the success of of Bitmax. Fast forward to today, our most popular product is a hundred times leverage um, perpetual swap contract. Essentially, uh, a lot of our clients they just want you know high leverage and get exposure to Bitcoin. Right. They don't understand why a futures contract expires why the futures contract trades at a different price than the underlying spot price. So we said, how can we create a leverage trading product that never expires and is completely synthetic, meaning there's no actual borrow and lending of collateral. And there's no settlement into it. There's no settlement as well, right? I mean, a normal futures contract normally has something in, into which you settle or expire, right? Whether it's an index contract where you s not settle, but you sort of expire into either you own the index or you sell it prior on expiration, right? So there's an index arbitrage available. That's a normal futures contract there. And whether it's a commodity or just an index linked future, that's one of the reasons why it expires, right? Because exactly you expire into expiration. I mean, into expiration, you have settlement. But the Bitcoin, you're saying you don't you don't do any exchange, so there's nothing to expire it into. <laughs> so you're right. really just rewarding so people for taking risk. Yeah, exactly. And to anchor. To give this a real-world anchor, we said, okay, let's peg an interest rate that's exchanged between longs and shorts that's dependent on where the price of the swap tree is relative to the underlying spot price of Bitcoin. They, and this interest rate sorry, is what – go ahead. I was going to say, do, do your clients understand the sort of technicalities around that? 
Um, I'd say most of them do not. What they do understand is that every eight hours, they'll either pay or receive interest to keep their position open. They do understand that because they're used to trading on margin. Right. So we created this product to mimic margin trading. Uh, and some of the more sophisticated traders understand that essentially what we've done is create an, a perpetual string of eight-hour futures contracts. And that has interesting implications for how you uh, price this particular derivative. Do you want to go through how the pricing works for me just so I can understand? Eight hour That's, perpetual. That's interesting. Essentially, we take a um, every every minute we look at the difference between the swap price and the spot price, and then we take an eight hour TWAP of of that premium or discount, and then we uh, will publish that rate, and that rate will be will be effective in the next eight hour period. So you see the published rate. You have eight hours to adjust your trading. So at the end of the eight hours, if you hold an open position, you will either pay or receive interest based on the notional value of, the, of your position. So it's like a constant CFD in a way. Correct. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, my guess is that most of the people that are trading that have no idea what they're doing. But in a way, they don't really care, right? All they really care about is if they're receiving or paying. And to the extent that they're trading at a hundred times leverage, if they're obviously if they're receiving, they're super happy. If they're paying, they got problems. Exactly, and it helps to keep the the market in line. Yeah, I mean, obviously, because people just want to continuously eliminate whatever arbitrages exist there, which is classic sort of arbitrage trading behavior. It's fascinating. So, how did you get to here? I mean. This is kind of less of an interview and more of a conversation for me. I'm really interested in this. And if you listen to some of the podcasting that we've done recently, like super interested in what's going on, um, if you back this up just into the blockchain space and less in Bitcoin, right? So what do you use as your main exchange to, to your base value for Bitcoin? What do you use? You say you track it, you publish something based on a base value. What are you using? Yeah. What's your main place to take that value and then publish it for that eight hours of time? We take an index of... Um, Bitstamp and GDAX, and it's an equally weighted index, and that's what we consider the spot price of Bitcoin. Now, we used to have more exchanges in that list. Right. So if you look at the rankings, uh, you know, obviously we're number one for Bitcoin US dollar trading volume, but number two, Bitfinex is a large spot exchange, and uh, unfortunately, they lost their um, banking facilities, so you're no longer at uh, you can't send or receive U.S. dollars into the exchange, and so we had to remove them from the index because traders can't. You know, it's, uh, there's a Bitcoin dollar price, but it actually is not cannot be referenced in reality because nothing can actually be delivered because right. you can't get in or out of their system. Right. And so that's some of the issues that we face with Bitcoin is that even the biggest and, uh, and the largest exchanges have issues with their banking and affects our derivatives because we have to find a universe of stable exchanges to base our, our prices on. Yeah. Wow. Really fascinating. I feel like you're, you just, like you said, you're just like at the infancy of this entire trading mechanism that's going to take place around Bitcoin. How do you handle the rest of the sort of alt currencies or cryptocurrencies that are out there? And how do you handle the fact that, and what's your view actually? I'm really interested on that. What's your view on the fact that like all these ICOs are just going out and creating new coins? Like, do you trade those? Will you write derivatives on those as well? Whether it's Ethereum or Ripple or anything really? I mean, so we want to let people trade whatever we think is going to be popular. Um, so right now we're purely a Bitcoin collateral exchange. So everything, whatever the product we list, your profit and loss is going to be based in Bitcoin. Right. So uh, we, we have a product that lets you trade the Ethereum Bitcoin exchange rate, uh, Litecoin Bitcoin exchange rate, um, some of the ICOs. Uh, we like to list futures contracts on an ICO before secondary market trading begins. So... We have a futures contract on a large ICO called uh, Tezos. Yep, Tezos. Um, the the you know the contribution period finished a few months ago, but it's the the actual Tezies won't be released until December. And we have and we give the traders the ability to go long or short with leverage, and what they think that exchange is going to be by the end of the year. Uh, and then in terms of you know the other altcoins, we tend to list the large cap altcoins because. You know, we're not going to be, you know, like a, some of these other altcoin exchanges that have 200 different coins no. that you can trade. 
Um, there's only really volume in, in the big ones, and and you can only really support a derivative on top of a coin that has a decently sized market cap. And we like to think of that as you know around the one billion US dollar mark. So if I look down the exchange, anything over a billion really would give you anything above Dash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Essentially, and what's so? Can you talk about the technology behind the blockchain at all? Like, is this something that interests you that you keep up with? Like, and how do you feel about you know the original blockchain? Then there's the Ethereum and all these because Tezos as well is building building an entire ecosystem around their own blockchain too, right? Yeah, I think a lot of people <clears throat> misunderstand that. Most of the things, apart from Bitcoin, are not money. It's some sort of application. Yeah, for sure. So it's not really – you shouldn't really compare Bitcoin with Ethereum because Ethereum is decentralized computing and Bitcoin is decentralized money. Right, but Bitcoin is based on a blo- blockchain technology, which is essentially so the same thing. That's what I'm asking about. I mean I, I, I know the difference between – the money, right? So a cryptocurrency and the platform on which it's built. And I'm, in a way, I'm kind of more interested in in the platform as well. So, do you use the blockchain to do all your settlement? Do you do it to do trusted um, contracts? In other words, do your stuff settle on the blockchain, or are you using a different mechanism to do that? So our stuff, we're uh, so the actual trading is centralized in our own database. So we use a KDB slash Q. It's a it's a language that all HFT hedge funds and banks use. Um, and so our, one of my co-founders, uh, Ben Dilo, that's what his expertise is in, and that's why we, we use that technology. So we interface with the blockchain to onboard customer deposits and send them withdrawals. Uh, but, so, all the, but all yeah. the back-end trading and settlement stuff is done on, what is it, KDB or KDB Plus? Uh, yeah, KDB Plus, yeah. That's an Arthur Whitney product, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's so strange. So I worked in a group called Fixed Income Research at Morgan Stanley back in the early 90s. And Arthur Whitney, along with Ken I- Keith Iverson and a whole bunch of other people, built a product called, on top of APL, actually called A+. And then Arthur kind of separated that and built KDB. So it's interesting to me. And I knew that hedge funds were using it, but I didn't realize that it had actually moved into this space as well. Um, just interesting to me. So wh- where do your co-founders come from? How do you guys know each other and... What were they doing before they were doing this? Uh, so I essentially was um, full-time trading Bitcoin after I lost my job at City, City Bank in 2013. And then I was trading on a derivatives exchange at the time called IcyBit. And yep. I, was un, I was dissatisfied with the progress they were making on improving their exchange. So I said, you know, why can't I do it myself? And I don't really know anything about technology, so... I started reaching out to people in my network saying, hey, I want to do this Bitcoin derivatives thing. And these are the type of people that I, I need to work with to, to actually make it happen. Uh, do, you, do you know anyone that might be interested? And I, I happened to find uh, my co-founder, Ben, who, you know, HFT background, and then other co-founder, uh, Sam, who is a full-stack web developer with a specialty in uh, Node.js and React. And they both... Thankfully, we're interested in Bitcoin and we're at a point in their life where they could devote time to a new project. So I pitched them the idea in January 2014. Um, we set, decided to do it and then we built we built the prototype, I mean, not the prototype, the, a live exchange in 11 months and, and launched in November. And what is the process around that? In other words, are you guys regulated by any, is it the HKMA, is it the MAS? Like, how does it work? Because you do call yourself an exchange. And and do you think at some point you'll issue your own coins, or have you done that already? Uh, so we are a, a Seychelles company. Seychelles. Our parent, so the the actual IP is owned by a Seychelles company and, and, and operates the exchange. Uh, and they don't really have a concept of a Bitcoin margin, Bitcoin settled derivative. Uh, so to that respect, uh, there's very little regulation around around this aspect. And we basically you know keep ourselves offshore, um, Bitcoin only. We don't do any sort of exchange. We don't really do much marketing. So it's really reverse inquiry. People hear about our products. Uh, they come on the platform and, and they start uh, trading with us. So to the extent that you know there's you know, regulations that would prohibit people from doing certain things, we try to stay purely in the offshore, uh, purely crypto realm uh, to you know basically st- sidestep a lot of that, a lot of some of those issues. Will we list our own coin? Uh, probably not. I don't really see how a token would really drive value for 
the, the buyers of it. You know, we don't want to issue an equity because that would be an obvious no no because that's a security. I understand. And you don't want to be issuing <laughs> unlicensed securities to millions of people. No, no, no. Let's not do that. <laughs> Let's not even talk yeah. about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, my phone broke up there for a second. I didn't hear it. <laughs> Yeah, let's not do that. Oops. Yeah, that's 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 our thinking on that. But I mean, it's it's the ICO market is so interesting and and cool to see the different types of projects and how much money they're raising with, you know, sometimes next to nothing. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the reasons why I asked, right, is because we do. I work in the startup realm, right? So I watch. A lot, I help a lot of companies raise money. I also mentor startups in Southeast Asia. I mean, I've been doing this for a while, and. You know, a lot of these startup companies are seeing what's going on. You know, you look at Tezos raised, what, just $200 million? So they're issuing their own yeah. coins. And even if you look at a company that's, well, it's a Singapore company, but it's essentially based in Bangkok, and it's called Omise. So they provide yeah. a Stripe competitor product. You saw that they issued, what, 20 to $25 million of Omise Go coins a few months ago. And it's now, if you look at the exchange, where is it? It's worth about um, six hundred million dollars of market cap, right? And it's one of the top listed. If you look at it, it's number eleven on this list. So it's now almost nine hundred million dollars. It's up eleven percent, ten and a half percent today. So I just wonder, like, what the future of this is going to be. In other words, I have my own view about what's going to happen to all these currencies. I think the same thing that happens to sort of fiat currencies, to the extent that you know you have to have a use for them, so they're going to consolidate over time into maybe five or six or maybe 10 big currencies that kind of trade and then intertrade with each other, maybe all based on Bitcoin or some Ether coin. I'm just curious what your view is on that. I mean, you're in this thing every single day. You have a much better perspective on this than I do, at least you and your, your team does. I'm wondering what you think about how that's going to develop. I think that each there's going to be a, each vertical will have a winner. So if mean? it's, you know... Like a prepaid card token, however that is tokenized, like Omisco, and I think uh, 10x is another yep. another one of those uh, type coins. There'll be a winner in that category. You have like the decentralized storage, so you have uh, Filecoin, yep. Storage, Made Save, all these. That's there. That's that's a vertical there. You have blockchain protocols, Ethereum, Tezos, EOS, Neo, like all, all these different things trying to be some sort of decentralized computing. That will power other applications. You have prediction markets like Augur, and Gnosis, um, and stocks. So there's going to be lots of different winners for each particular vertical that a, a project or a team is, is going after. So I think there's going to be hundreds of you know billion dollar plus coins in the future. But obviously, the vast majority of ICOs will be worthless in probably a decade. Right, they will be right, and will they? But will they actually go to zero in the same way that sort of the Greek drachma or the you know the Brazilian real? You're maybe a little too young to remember all this stuff, but where those guys went to zero and had to sort of reissue all their government bonds and then you know reissue a currency? Is that the same thing that's going to happen to some of these ICOs where the coins themselves are just going to be useless and the liquidity of them is just going to be terrible? They're just going to disappear. Yeah, because the team is probably going to move on to something else. There'll be no more updates in the GitHub uh, for the actual project. And then, you know, there'll be no more market. So the exchanges will delist it because there's no interest in trading it. And so, you know, it'll be forgotten. Yeah, I just think it's really interesting. A anyway, so what do you think the future is for you guys? I mean, so you're trading, how many products now do you have that you're trading? Probably, I think, about 15 different products we have on the exchange right now. Okay, and I know that there was an announcement yesterday, right? So UBS comes in and says they're going to start allowing their customers to trade Bitcoin and Bitcoin style products, right? What's your view on Oh, these? they did? Yeah, they did. UBS they, said that. Yeah. Okay. I think it was either yesterday or the day before. I can't remember, which was one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you, right? Because if you're literally the largest derivatives exchange for Bitcoin, I mean, obviously UBS, um, you know, Goldman Sachs, all these companies have gigantic, and Citigroup as well, and Deutsche too, all have gigantic derivatives businesses and derivative books, right? I just wonder, do those guys come in and do this, or they really just don't have the ability to come in and disintermediate what you're doing or do they just go out and buy your business? Like, what do you think? And like, how long do you expect to be in this and running this and how many more products and all that other stuff? Like, what's the future for you? So I think that there's going to be a bifurcation of the market between um, regulated players or, you know, a large financial institution, legacy exchanges who will cater to, you know, institutions that can only trade with like 
institutions, right? So a Bridgewater cannot trade with BitMEX. I don't care if I had, you know, XYZ CTF, CFTC regulation, right. Bridgewater will never trade with a startup. They're, they'll trade with Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, a, big, a large prime broker, right. CME. So um, I think it's futile for a startup to try to get all these licenses and convince, a, you know, a, an organization like a Bridgewater or a Templeton or a CalPERS to trade Bitcoin with them because they're never going to do it. So when, you know, UBS and, you know, all these different banks are going to announce that they're going to service Bitcoin, they're going to allow their clients to buy Bitcoin. They are not going to allow the person in Indonesia to purchase Bitcoin because that's not, that's not their client base. Right. So we see ourselves as um, competing with the 80% or 90% of the world that is not serviced by a large financial institution. institution. Those are the people that we want to, to be our client because those people have a small amount of money and we can onboard them essentially for free because all it is is it's Bitcoin and that's all done uh, automated fashion. There's no human interaction for sending Bitcoin across, across the network. So once we can onboard uh, a customer with low amounts of assets essentially for free, we can start offering them the same product that an investment bank offers uh, a fidelity, um, but we can offer it to, you know, XYZ person uh, in Jakarta, in, in, in Mumbai, in other, in other places. And so become a bank for the unbanked, really, and financial inclusion. Um, there's the speculative side of the stuff that we have right now, the 100x leverage products, but we want to move into more traditional savings and investments products. So one thing we're launching later this year is the ability for our select people to give us Bitcoin and we'll essentially sell you a total return swap on a blue chip equity listed in the United States. So how does and that so we'll let, how does that work structurally? Because I have I've got a thousand questions around that too, and I think I know the way this is going to develop, but I want your opinion. But how does that work? So I have a Bitcoin and you're gonna you're gonna create a product that's gonna let me trade essentially a blue chip stock without me buying it, yeah? Correct. So oh. you so essentially you uh, you want to buy one share of uh, Alibaba. Alibaba is say worth hundred US dollars. You give us hundred US dollars of Bitcoin. Uh, we uh, then can buy that that stock for you on a principal basis, and we will move that exposure to you via a total return swap, where you will receive all the dividends, all the corporate actions. Um, you hopefully will make money on your on your trade. Uh, when you're ready to leave, you'll take your uh, U.S. dollar profit, FX that into Bitcoin, and we send that Bitcoin amount back to you. So at no time do you touch stock, at no time do you touch uh, any fiat currency. It's Bitcoin in, Bitcoin out. But essentially, uh, you have now transformed your Bitcoin into a synthetic holding of uh, a stock. Okay, so I think I've now stumbled upon the future of trading houses. Um, so here's, here's what I think, and tell me what you think just historically. In the old days, right, let's, and let's just use the United States as a, pro- as a proxy for the financial world, although it's the same thing in Europe, right, whether it's in, um, in Germany or in, in London and potentially in Switzerland as well. But you essentially had four or five large firms, right, that were running, um, you know, trading houses. And to be fair, those trading houses were second citizens to the investment banks, right? The investment banks were, and I put this in qu- deep quotes, right? Where, <laughs> no, but you have to understand like where I'm coming from. I'm saying the words, but I want people to understand it's in deep quotes, right? So the investment banks, the people that are doing an M&A were these sort of genteel, smart guys. And it was mostly guys at the time. We know it's much better now, although not as good as it should be. And other firms found market gaps and those gaps were then closed by Lehman Brothers and, you know, Goldman Sachs and Solomon Brothers, and they came in and they got much more aggressive with the creation of new and sort of derivative products. You can go all the way into the 70s and 80s and say, you know, when Solly got into the mortgage market, it kind of confused the rest of the sort of blue blood investment bankers because they didn't understand that derivative side of the market. They were more interested in, you know, you buy a share of IBM, you put it in an account, and you kind of hold it forever. But it sounds to me like, and remember, the people that traded those were the sons and daughters of the people that were originally trading the stocks. So now you're a generation or two past that. And those people, those wealthy people, and even the people without wealth, right, because you mentioned the unbanked too, are now the majority of people in the world that are looking for ways to invest and earn return, right? Because that's what you're doing. You're just giving people a way to earn return and you're, doing, you're giving them a way to do it in a way that's frictionless. At least that's what it seems like to me. So if that's the case, 
Do you see a movement away of this 80% of the people that are sort of untrained and unbanked and who don't trade with UBS or don't trade with Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank coming to places like BitMEX to get kind of all of their financial products? And I, and, and, and do you I mean, see, but don't you think so? And don't you see, because I was, when I was doing this research, I thought, hmm, KYC, right? Sarbanes, Oxley, all the stuff that kind of came in and took out the ability for what people call investment banks, but are really large trading houses to run, um, you know, risk books as well, right? It, makes, yeah, exactly. it just makes it a lot harder for them to give total returns to people. Harder, but not impossible. <clears throat> but now you've found a way to do that. And you've really found a way to disintermediate that entire system, right? By writing these sort of eight hour continuously non expiring futures contracts that allow you to write total return swaps against almost anything. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, we think Bitcoin is a form of global collateral that allows us to, you know, touch everyone um, if they want to be touched. If they, if they want to invest, if they want to save, we have a way to get them that product and to interface with the traditional, you know, stocks, bonds, commodities, and give that same ability to invest and save to someone, you know, who has 100 U.S. dollars in savings rather than someone, only people who have a million U.S. dollars in savings. Right. And I mean, that was really the genesis of the online brokers, too. Whether you go to TD Waterhouse or Charles Schwab or even E-Trade, their idea was let's democratize the ability to trade stocks. And essentially what you're saying is we're going to democratize it even more. I mean, I think if you look forward or even look backward into the development of the blockchain and hence into Bitcoin and the rest of these distributed ledger products, which is what they really are. It's really the democratization of almost everything, right? Contracts, money, and everything that's associated with any type of transaction. And I don't necessarily mean something you pay for, but just things that get transacted, right? Yeah, exactly. So how big do you think you your team gets? Not the number of people, but just in the business, right? So if you give people a way to deposit Bitcoin with you, and then you can use those to write total returns, right? is there any kind of financial product that you won't be able to do? I mean, we're not going to be able to do spot trading. Um, we won't be able to, uh, <clears throat> to to do those those types of services. Um, but yeah, it, it, the sky's the limit with financial engineering and a form of money good collateral in a digital format. There's a lot you can do. Uh, I think the big thing is being is cracking. How do we get a debt market going in a deflationary currency? Um, that I think is going to be the holy grail of hopefully BitMEX, but the, you know, the industry in general. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about that. Cause I haven't thought about it yet, but a debt market with a deflating currency. So why is the currency deflating? And then where does debt come into play? So let's say that I'm a, I'm a business and I want to borrow some money yep. and I am going to invest in something and, and hopefully earn a return to pay back my loan. Right. Now in a inflationary, uh, fiat currency, uh, I'm not worried that, let's say I make my money in dollars. So I'm a business and I borrowed some Bitcoin. And I took that Bitcoin and I had to turn it into dollars to invest in my, my property, plant, and equipment to, to grow my business. Sure. And now because people ascribe a scarcity value to Bitcoin because there's a fixed amount of supply, right. the price of Bitcoin has doubled by the time I need to go pay back my loan. Now the person that let me that Bitcoin wants one Bitcoin back, right. regardless of what the U.S. dollar price of that one Bitcoin is. Correct. But I'm making U.S. dollars. Right. So my my loan, the nominal amount of my loan, uh, that has gone up double versus you know the fiat currency that I actually earn. So that is the issue, is that you know people still make investments and earn money in a fiat currency. They pay their taxes in a fiat currency. Right. How do, we, how do they borrow a cryptocurrency that has a fixed supply and on a theoretical basis will continue to go up in price relative to something that will continue to go down in price because more of it is printed every year? But this is, this is a solved problem in a way, right? I mean, I guess the only difference really is that, because we used to see this a lot, right? You'd be in Japan where there are super low interest rates, so you'd borrow money in, in yen. You'd switch it into Australian dollars. You'd buy Australian real estate and hope that the real estate would increase in value and would protect you from any FX risk. There were a whole bunch of, what were they called, quantos written to do this. The only difference is that you're talking about one fiat currency and another fiat currency. So you're not talking about deflationary in either one of those cases necessarily, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's not as volatile uh, as, as Bitcoin uh, or, or some of the other 
uh, digital currencies. So there's, there's an added impact there. So it's, it's an issue of, you know, how do you create this market? And then how do you uh, get a worthy set of borrowers? Because a lot of the time there is no legal, uh, if I don't pay you back a Bitcoin, do I really owe you any money? Right. This is not considered a currency or a property or a commodity in a particular uh, legal jurisdiction. And if we're in a purely digital world and it's a digital entity borrowing from another digital entity, then how do you... Uh, in a real world, collect your debts. So can't you use, and I'm asking, right? I'm not telling, I'm just asking because I, I find it fascinating, but can't you use the blockchain itself or, you know, or Ethereum, these backend services to write a, a contract that automatically executes based on KPIs where you have dollars deposited in an account and Bitcoin deposited in an account and the contract automatically executes based on some KPI and it just automatically executes on the chain so the chain executes the contract for you regardless of the law. Do you know what I mean? So you're already getting into a position now where some of these blockchain smart contracts execute automatically. And sure, they're going Bitcoin to Bitcoin maybe or Bitcoin to Ether. But couldn't you write one of those contracts where it's Bitcoin to dollars or Bitcoin to Aussie or whatever? Sure, but at some point you need to – you're investing in something. So there's risk that yep. whatever you're buying doesn't you know, pan out and you can't pay back that loan. Uh, so you know, what is the redress? Uh, how does the legal system going to treat that? Um, you know, a smart contract is a smart contract, but you know, there's a reason why governments have guns because they force you to pay things <laughs> that you wouldn't otherwise pay. So it's without, not, I don't without think that I want to. I don't think I want violence. How do you, you know, ensure people are going to pay up? I, I I don't know. I mean, how do you do that today? I don't even want to talk about governments and guns today. Actually, I see enough of it on the news every day. I'm not sure I like any of it, but um, yeah, I don't know. So how do you address that? In other words, you said it was the holy grail. So are you working towards that? It's something I'm thinking about. Uh, I'm always thinking about how do, you, how do you get a real debt market going? Because once you have a debt market for crypto, and businesses and borrowing in, in Bitcoin to invest in services, then you have a real economy around this. Now, this would all be solved if I, as a laborer, only wanted to get paid in Bitcoin. Right? And I went to the store and paid in Bitcoin. Now, you know, obviously, you know, say maybe 200 years in the, in the price volatility of Bitcoin is, uh, you know, pretty much nothing, then yes, the whole economy can, you know, run on, on Bitcoin. But if the value of Bitcoin fluctuates too much versus real goods like food, your right. shelter, right. 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 Uh, energy, then it's very tough for people to purely trade their services and time for Bitcoin. So you think it's just too early? Yeah, it's, I think it's just too early. I think it's one of those things that you know people will come up with innovative ways. Maybe it's a smart contract. Maybe it's uh, uh, the way that uh, a, a particular type of derivative is structured, or there's a particular set of companies that are considered like you know AAA in the in the digital currency space that can that can borrow. And, and this you know we have an emergence of a, na a real natural economy um, that's purely focused in, in digital currencies. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't stop thinking about this. Again, if you go back and listen to some of the podcasts that we've done, just Graham and I talking to each other, we just keep going back and forth on what the implications of the, the chain is going to be, right? And then also what the cryptocurrency impact is going to be. And frankly, I don't think anybody really knows yet. We have a bunch of ideas, but it does sound to me like you guys are at the forefront of this. You know, the whole idea of ATP stories is really to find out about the people that are doing these things. And I don't feel like I, I feel like I've given you a little bit of short shrift. Where, where are you from anyway? So I'm from Buffalo, uh, New York, which is a <laughs> oh small town near Toronto, yeah, or across Northern. the border. And then you ended up at, did you go to high school in, in uh, Buffalo as well? Uh, yeah, I went to high school in Buffalo. Uh, and then I went Wharton. to you, yeah, Wharton undergrad. Uh, then I did Chinese in school as well. Uh, I decided to do a study abroad in Hong Kong, came over to Hong Kong, loved it. And then, you know, just basically I, I emailed every single like large bank. I got one interview at Deutsche Bank and then came over that summer and then got a job. And then now I'm here. Do you think you ever leave Asia? Like you're never going to go back and live in Buffalo, I presume. No. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, no. my, my parents live in Philadelphia. I'm never going back to live in Philadelphia. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> Why? And it's funny for me. I always ask people this. I know this is way off piece, right? But you're from Buffalo. So it's, you know, when I was a kid, right, Buffalo was always the place where, like, the local news station would kind of drive up there when it was snowing. 
Yeah. There would be like 18 feet of snow. And that was always from Buffalo. Like it wasn't from any other town. You know, it wasn't from Schenectady or anything else. It was just always Buffalo. I know Buffalo is closer to the border of Canada. But like how do you go from there? Like were you super happy in college not having to deal with like eight feet of snow and shoveling the drive like for mom and dad or? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've just always wanted to to like leave and go to a big, <laughs> bigger place. So I never, I never had any any illusions that I wanted to stay in Buffalo. And whether that was I ended up in New York or LA or you know Miami or somewhere like that, I, I always knew that I wanted to go to a, a big city. And so uh, luckily, I you know I made a decision. I, I, what, what book did I read? It was a. Uh, it's called Ugly Americans. It's about. I know a, I know the guys actually in that book. So yeah, I know. I mean, I, I'm friends with some of the guys who work for the guy who's, who's in that book, and I was like, "Oh, this sounds awesome! I think Asia is the place to to go to to make real real money." And then I, you know, did some thinking. Okay, well, you know, Japan that may have been the trade in 1985, right. but you know, in 2004, 2005, China. it's China. Yeah. So. so the interesting thing is, you're you're a Mandarin speaker, yeah. Very badly these days. <laughs> but you well, because obviously you're in, you're in Cantonese land, so it's hard to speak Mandarin there. But I mean, I'm a, and because you and I are like different generations, I'm a Japanese speaker for exactly the reasons that you just said. Right. So yeah. I, f- I find that really interesting. And so yeah, that's how I ended up here, and yeah, I never. I, I like Asia. It's great. Even if you get bored, you can leave and go somewhere else. And you know, there's lots of Bitcoiners who they're digital nomads, but they pretty much hang out in Thailand. Because fast internet, cheap food, good weather, nice water sports, and you know, and and they like like the lifestyle. Yeah, and again, you may or may not know this, right? But the startup ecosystem here is actually pretty vibrant, right? So you know, when people talk about Bangkok, and you know, I won't go into this a lot, but when people talk about Bangkok, they talk about things that are anathema to me, right? For me, it's the business environment here, the fact that everything is green fields. Um, and, you know, I hate the cold. So, you know, I'd never go live in Buffalo. I, you know, I shoveled enough snow in Connecticut for the rest of my life. So I never want to do that again. But here, like I said, you know, I deal with digital nomads all the time. And I think that the next progression of great startup companies is definitely going to be in Southeast Asia. You know, China is doing things that are amazing. But the proximity of the 630 million people in Southeast Asia to me to China is just, you can't be um, exaggerated how important that is. And you know, Bangkok, whether you're in Bangkok or you're in Hong Kong, right? So you're completely connected to China, but being in Bangkok is the central of Southeast Asia. So for me, it's the right place to be. Look, let's do yeah. this. I have had an amazing time talking to you, and I know for sure. So I, wanna, I want you to be back on again. As a matter of fact, what, what we're trying to do is get a stable of people that come on every, like, six weeks or so to talk about their industry. What you're doing is, and you know this better than I do, right? But what you're doing from an exchange perspective and also, you know, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin excuse me, um, in the derivative space, like very few other people are doing, and if they are, they're not doing it well. But stuff changes really fast. Yeah. You know, we could have a completely different discussion in two months than we're having today because you could have new products and new customers. The whole world could be different. So hopefully you'll agree to come back on. Absolutely. Yeah, this was really good for me. Hopefully it's interesting for you as well. Um, and anyway, I just wanted to, to say thank you. I mean, I want to thank Arthur Hayes for coming on. BitMEX sounds like it's a great business and really just in the infancy with the rest of the industry that it's in. And I look forward to talking to you more, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.